Afternoon all, let's have a look today, continuing our Evolution of Style series, let's have a look at Alexander Alekhine's only win against Emmanuel Lasker, which occurred in Zurich 1934. Now some people would argue that um, Alexander Alekhine, he didn't really want to lose his title and he picked his challenges quite carefully with the London sort of conditions of having to raise quite a lot of money, uh, which made it difficult for Kappa actually to get a rematch. Um, and it ended up being Berlimu and, uh, you know, Yuva. And Yuva unexpectedly, you know, toppled, uh, you know, one against Alekhine, despite the press, you know, severely, um, um, I think, favouring um, Alekhine. Every, everyone didn't expect Alekhine to lose, but he, he managed, he became the first champion to regain his world t uh, title against Yuva when he stayed off uh, the alcohol and, alcohol and drunk milk instead, apparently, as, as the stories go. But, um, uh, you know, Yuva was 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 a great champion as well, and he, he did much to um, popularise chess, especially in the Netherlands. Um, but Lasker, you know, was lurking around the scenes, was the longest world champion, and you know the margins which he lost, say to Capablanca, was actually six two. But um, uh, Lasker's record against Alakine was actually favourable. Um, and I'm just going to pause the video to, to, to check, or I could uh, take you to ChessGamesCom right now, in fact. I'll take you to ChessGamesCom, and if we look at ChessGamesCom and put Alakine versus um, Lasker, uh, this is a way of getting the match record. And you'll see here, it says here, Lasker actually beats Alexander Alakine three to one with four draws. Uh, which is quite impressive, and even more impressive actually. And this is actually quite frightening. Um, if you if you look, for example, at the nineteen um, twenty four victory where Alaska really thumped Alakine in New York, uh, I checked actually on an accuracy check on chesspo.st, and the accuracy of Emmanuel Lasker is often approaching Houdini's strength like 60% plus. Um, very, very high accuracy. And it's almost as if Lasker's, you know, it's like playing against Houdini. You know, it's, he, I think his middle game, Lasker's middle game seems to be uh, highly powerful. And to say that other world champions, like, were, were definite, you know, evolutions over Lasker is a bit much. Up until 1925, it seemed Lasker was still a huge giant in the game. This, this is this is Las Lasker's only um, defeat at the hands of Alexander Alekhin. Um It's a it's an interesting you know um, defeat. Well, it definitely had the positional pressure going. So from that, from a stylistic point of view, uh, there was the basis of the attack from the very strong position and the neat tactic, uh, which blew Black away, which. I'll let you guess when we get there. Okay, so um, let's have a look. So Alexander kicked off with d4. And then we have something very, very popular in those times. Despite the hypermoderns, uh, the Queen's Gambit was on the rage. Queen's Gambit declined. None of this uh, more modern Slav stuff. They didn't mind blocking in their bishop on c8. They played e6. It was seen as okay, you know. Later, you could get the bishop out as a challenge to get the bishop out with some sort of advantages. Uh, so knight c3, knight f6. Now uh, knight f3 from Alexander, not minding losing the c pawn. Maybe he's got e4 with a bit of compensation. Um, so bishop e7, or more more than enough compensation. Bishop g5. Okay, black black's game's a little bit cramped. Knight bd7. But it's classic, it's absolutely classic stuff. E3 off the castles. Now delaying uh, the bishop on f1, delaying because you know black might play d takes c4 with bishop d3. So why not wait a little bit longer with a useful waiting move? Rook c1. Um so rook c1 is is going to put pressure on the c file usually in a classic minority attack. If black plays c6, um, you know the c6 is, is going to be vulnerable on the c file later anyway. c6, okay, and now finally bishop d3. 
and um, black makes the bishop uh, waste a bit of time with d takes c4 uh, to try and free the position a bit now offering an exchange of dark square bishops which Alexander accepts he accepts the exchange of dark square bishops so okay in this position uh, maybe you would say there's nothing really to, to write home about for white um, but I think he's got a small edge now this is this is an interesting Alexander Alakai maneuver we've seen before but where someone disastrously played after knight e4 well in a similar sort of position f5 where Alexander just retreated back in and exploited the dark squares uh, but in this game uh, that's not the case there's another point behind the move knight e4 uh, which is just just to put the knight in an attacking position on g3 uh, so knight 5 to f6 offering exchange knights it's refused knight g3 so is the knight bad here the knights look quite pretty by each other here on f3 and g3 but is black equalizing when you plays this e5 break which looks to be kind of thematic possible downside here though this diagonal pin on f7 the f5 square which can be pounced on with this knight are these significant dynamic factors to compensate for black seemingly liberating um, his pieces well white just castles now and now um, the move e takes d4 is played and Alexander doesn't want necessarily and he's not necessarily forced uh, to play e takes d4 this this pawn potentially is vulnerable later as a nice like, queen's pawn you know maybe like knight b6 black could set up a blockade square on d5 so actually a different uh, method was chosen um, well actually the, the pawn wasn't immediately recaptured in fact the black queen was attacked so knight f5 and off to queen d8 the f5 knight is kind of juicy it's it's kind of Kasparov's favorite knight position actually on the king side the f5 square it's it's quite juicy here because it's it's attacking quite uh, important squares especially on the king side g7 and if if the g7 pawn can be sort of weakened further you know provoked for g6 then black will end up with potentially critical dark square weaknesses around his king okay so the knight wants to be left on f5 but what to do about the d pawn okay well knight three takes d4 was was chosen so you can see that there's a problem bishop here it looks as though black hasn't properly equalized unfortunately and not only that uh, with this structure it seems white's in a greater position to use the semi open d file pressure than black the semi open e file pressure um, but okay so knight e5 at least this bishop's got scope but the knights protecting each other quite neatly here so f5 is not a big deal at the moment this bishop on c4 can just retreat now and here it's interesting actually man was a bit worried about that bishop on f5 he must be he took it off there uh, so bishop takes f5 but white's got a horrible nagging edge now and an invasory move coming up he doesn't want to exchange off queens here the d file looks fairly unpleasant he plays queen b6 but this invasory move by alexander using the center as a pivot actually to get to black's king and we see this echoed in a lot of games that sometimes uh, you know the d6 square is a kind of pivot square uh, for the king side as well if, if a queen can sometimes do this kind of action or i from g3 you get that a lot in Sicilian variations the queen on g3 i not just the central square d6 but also the king side usually so here queen d6 is a useful pivot square to get to the black king actually so the immediate question is is what to do about this poor knight as well and if rook e8 then there's the rude um you know knight e7 check winning a piece you know queen takes c7 on this black wants to give up the exchange so the knight moves back rather humbly and it looks fragile black's position looks fragile because we've got this nasty unchallenged light square bishop pinning that pawn nasty pressure on the d-file black is not able to use his semi-open e-file so in terms of the trump cards being exploited uh, white is much further down the line for exploiting his particular trump cards in the position 
already. That default is not just being used um, to put black in a passive position uh, with the knights, but also as a pivot for the queen. So rook fd1 reinforces the default pressure. After rook a d8, now we see this queen g3 move. The queen's nicely parked, threatening immediate mate in one. What does black do about it? It's difficult, very diff very difficult position now. Um, let's say I don't I've, knight h5 looks terrible to play, uh, but I wonder what the concrete refutation is. Actually, let's just engine check this knight h5. If he wanted to try and avoid like a weakening move, um, here queen g5. Then we've got some nasty threats, and apparently, you know, like um, is recommended here anyway uh, because if, if say something like knight f6 then we've got g4 and it starts to be very unpleasant okay okay let's turn that off so the for unfortunately g6 is a further compromise uh, to Emmanuel's position here so he's got these these weakened dark squares now without a fianchetto bishop to cover them so the king is is slightly more naked and it's also coming out now after queen g5 not coming out sorry or trying to do something about the position of the king safety with king h8 so at least i suppose king h8 is at least me you know means is this knight going to go away now but the knight's unfortunately got a really good square d6 to go to here and it uses that to attack f7 now so the king is now forced back unfortunately into the firing lines and into the pins with king g7 so alexander's got a magnificent basis uh, for a nice attack here this position already uh, so the combinations don't appear out of nowhere in, in alexander's game sometimes he you know he has to have a very good position for these magic uh, combinations to, to to flow naturally so in that way you know he's a universal style player his middle game i think is is equivalent to modern GMs and, and certainly Laska okay not in this game Laska played passively the the opening seemed to give him you know major issues which he didn't recover from basically but in previous encounters Laska's you know playing Houdini strength you know up to 60 70 percent Houdini agreement Laska's a formidable player but in this game yeah he's, he's on the wrong foot here he started on the wrong foot after e4 um, this e4 now means if you look at e4 that the third rank is cleared for for potential you know rook moves uh to and which are pretty lethal actually because you imagine a rook and a queen coordinating for queen h6 and then you know if queen h6 then we've got f7 vulnerable we've got on, on the diagonal and other issues to deal with as well it's it's starting to look pretty nasty and this retreat doesn't inspire confidence now um, knight g8 does not inspire confidence black's holding on by a thread and that thread's about to be disconnected cut with a scissors quite severely now uh, the next move is a rook lift and other rook lifts might be equally dangerous i think on engine checking this game earlier um you know i think any any rook lift here rook c3 is also very dangerous because basically that third rank is also now a pivot for the queen uh, and rook to coordinate and also knight f5 is still on the cards it's all really dangerous but rook d3 okay and now this irritating queen is attempted to be evicted okay with this next move but black's position is really really difficult here anyway um i suppose this game is an advert for playing the slav actually because uh, because white really just got major trump cards out of the opening um i think based on on blacks i know oh, there was an inaccuracy there must have been an inaccuracy played here i think the e5 um earlier but anyway let's let's continue f6 okay so did the queen go back does it need to go back no it doesn't need to go back after knight f5 check, the king is forced only square, king h8. Now I'll give you 20 seconds here, guys. So 20 seconds starting from now. I wonder if you can predict the
the next move for white. You may want to pause the video here. So 20 seconds starting from now. Okay, when you have a great position, combination should flow. This is a great position. Um, White's rook on the third rank is particularly uh, dangerous, not just for default doubling up, but also for kingside operations. So I'm hoping you found this move. If you haven't, just think of this principle. Appreciate the significance of the seemingly insignificant. Because I think Alexander Alakine really demonstrated he had a full grip on the concept of this penetrating glance. He could see subtle resources in the position, which made him especially tactically dangerous. And you know, his combinatory vision, you know, was brilliant. And here, you know, it's a simple, neat combination move. So what's seemingly insignificant and outrageous? I hope you spotted it. Queen takes G6. Wow. And here, the Lasker was forced to resign because it's pretty nasty. Uh, well, if you don't take the queen, you're going to get mated on g7. Um, there's how, how to defend g7 here. The rook's not very helpful. You just can take it. There's nothing which can come in contact to defend g7. And if you do take it, then this rook h3 check is lethal because this knight on f5, Spark's favorite knight, is doing a fine job of guarding g7. And the bishop on the diagonal means that even if the desperate move knight h6 is played, rook takes h6 is still mate, because that square is cut off and that square is cut off. Um, these guys are doing a great job. So it was a wrong-footed opening, really, to be fair. Lasker was still a very, very powerful player, um, and probably one, you know, deliberately, you know, he, I don't think Alexander would have been too keen to have risked his world title playing playing Lasker. Uh, but let's look at the game again in earlier years, you know, preferring, I think he was comfortable playing Berlima and, and Juve, at least optimistic. I think more, you could argue he would have been more optimistic than to have been playing Lasker for a World Championship uh, challenge. So 1934 Zurich. So this game where Black did not really properly equalise after knight d5, it seems, because... This was a good move, knight e4, it seems, in retrospect. Although I'm curious looking at this, what, what, what would be wrong with queen b4 check? I can't, can't resist just engine checking this position. f5 is actually was, a, was shown for a moment there. So queen d2 and white would still be better just, just with the queens off. There's this bishop problem, I think. Okay, so um, Black didn't want to do that. So after knight g3, it seems some problems here with e5. I mean, maybe as a thematic break, e5 is the wrong one to choose, you know, here. Maybe uh, c5 is is better in, the, in a way, because you're trying to use this trump, sorry, compensate for a particularly bad bishop, but not really, you don't really want to emphasize this bishop either. So c5 and this plan of a6, b5, Bishop b7, as a Cobian mentioned, might be better because you want to leave this pawn maybe defensively on e6. That pawn not only means this f7 pawn won't be pinned, it means a knight to f5 won't be possible. It's guarding f5 as well. So to move, for, for choosing this break, e6 to e5 instead of c6 to c5, it seems a bit risky, as demonstrated by this game in retrospect. So white castled. So White's got basically two immediate like tactical trump cards, you know, this bishop on the diagonal, and this ability to use the f5 square. Just because of that break was chosen e5. Uh, that pawn break. So knight f5, and the trump cards are kind of used here. So the bishop sitting nicely on the diagonal, and without a challenger now after bishop takes f5. So White's advantages are accumulating. So queen b6, and now the basis for the attack. Basically, this, this invasory queen d6 makes sure black's not getting away with anything. All, all of white's uh, pieces are coming together as a, as a team here, in fact. 
after rook ft1 there's beautiful coordination there's no bad piece in the white position the queen's uh, use of d6 is a pivot to get to the black king side to f induce further uh, king side weaknesses is is very very nice here this queen d6 to g3 maneuver um and and the pressure is just nagging now really irritating off the queen g5 it supports more things queen g5 uh you know in some variations you know queen h6 is going to be dangerous just, just just to try and mate in others rook d6 is going to be dangerous um for example if you put in a token move here a6 rook d6 is really dangerous like 98 you've got rook takes g6 just shows the devastation black could be subjected to this kind of variation uh, with, with 97 mating so this this use of the d-file is is really um as a basis for the attack not just the queen rerouting but also a rook coming to d6 show, shows the power of white's uh, position here against the black king okay so king h8 and knight d6 drawing the king out because how else is f7 being defended here so the king's having to defend uh, itself f7 but after e4 we have more uh, sort of pivot possibilities using the, the third rank as a pivot to to amplify the attack so knight g8 rook d3 and it's it's all starting to look really bad really really bad with this rook being able to luxuriously come to h3 if needed uh, so f6 and the game's finished off quite quickly now after check and this crushing blow appreciating the significance of the insignificances which is which is helped when you've got a winning position anyway of course um, you know a huge bishop on the diagonal and a huge knight on f5 and a rook with, with great versatility so queen takes g6 maybe isn't so magical as it first might seem so uh, causing resignation but um okay uh, comments or questions on youtube hope you enjoyed that Thanks very much.